for, but we will start our little, uh, uh, like I said, theistic marathon with Landon in Oklahoma, who has a question for Matt. So I think that means I will mute up. Hmm. Hello. Hey, Landon. Hey, how are you doing? I- I'm okay. How are you? I am slightly terrified and excited to ask you this question. Well, there's, I don't know. I don't know what there is to be terrified of, but ask your I, question. I just have, I'm not afraid. It, it's, a, it's a social anxiety thing. Uh, but the question that I wanted to ask is kind of long-winded, but I've been watching quite a bit of your content as of late, and it's really helped me deal with and properly parse a lot of really, really bad belief systems that I have dealt with in my exposure to things like fundamentalism, cults, experiencing these other people. And so as contrarian as this may be to ask as a potential theist, I want to ask you, how would I best be able to challenge people who are more deep-seated in what I would view as fallacious or incorrect beliefs? How do you go about bringing somebody into a position where you can challenge that without it being seen as something like an attack on their person. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm a little confused. That's not quite the question I thought you were asking. Um, so one more time for clarity, just the question at the end, just so that I know, because what it says here in the, in the call screen thing is that you wanted to know how from a theistic perspective, I can encourage people to explore and challenge their beliefs uh, to ensure their beliefs are rooted in logic. And the question you asked seems to be different. So whatever question it is you want, no, ask it the, one more the, time. The question in the the question in the screening is correct. I'm just stumbling over my words here. I apologize. Okay. I, it's fine either way, because if, I think those are two very different questions. The one thing is, if you want to say from beginning from a theistic perspective, perspective how would I encourage someone to to ensure that their beliefs are rooted in logic. And the answer is you can't. Um, yeah. Theism is the position of being convinced that some God exists. And so that position does not entail that one should value truth or logic. Um, if we begin with even, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my, my meds are making me, uh, in a burp, which I'll try to do quietly. If we begin with a specific version of theism, like a biblical theism, then you've already accepted some foundation that could encourage uh, logical evaluation. But if that logical evaluation ultimately defeats that specific version of theism, then the, the foundation you have for valuing logic goes away. So then the whole thing ends up collapsing. Only someone whose foundation begins with, I care about truth and reason, can then warrant that. If it turns out that there's a theism that is consistent with this desire for truth and reason, cool, then it will survive that test. But truth slash reason slash logic must be the foundation, and then anything else if you put anything else first, it can potentially erode that. So not not a specific version of theism, nor theism in general, carries with it any sort of requirement to care about truth or logic. I wish it did, but all that all then it would no, I mean, all would be at that exact same boat. Yeah, all it would be at that point is here's why I care about truth and logic. If somebody said, "I care about truth and logic because." Logic is the most consistently reliable method of evaluating claims to determine truth. That would be cool. But when they say, I value truth and logic because God says so, or because the Bible says so. It goes right out the window. Yeah. And and if truth and logic demonstrate or fail to affirm the position that that they're using as the foundation, then it all collapses. I mean, I I wish it were otherwise. It'd It'd be great. If there was a way... To begin with theism, the the de facto, I am convinced some God exists, and then say, because of that, I now care about logical reasoning and, you know, 
constructing valid and sound syllogisms. That would be wonderful, except that anything that would justify that also is irrelevant because the fact that logical reasoning leads us reliably or as reliably as we can to a, a true understanding of reality is its own reason. It's like saying, I love someone, I love you because God told me to love you. Would you rather have someone love you or say they love you because God told them to or because they just love you? No, you hit it right on the head with that because one of the things I've experienced witnessing just interacting with these different groups, being part of collegiate ministries and whatnot, is people who will say exactly that. They'll say, hey, God told me to love you. And so that is the absolute depth of their expression. And you can tell anybody observing from the outside is like, that's not love. You are being yeah. entirely facetious and it is entirely disingenuous. Meanwhile, I'm over here trying to kind of better understand these things and realize, hey, I love you because you have innate human value and you're somebody that I respect, or perhaps we share some common goal or interest, or perhaps I'm related to you and value you. And what I find frustrating is this dichotomy and exactly that kind of tragedy that you talk about, which is that outside of assuming some kind of belief system to be true, these kinds of assumptions or declarations mean nothing. They don't have any value. Landon, I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure, shoot. I am more than happy to answer questions. So on my end, it says you're a theist, so you do still hold some theistic faith-based belief, right? That I do. Okay. So, and and I, I may just be in danger of basically making the same point by by asking you some questions, but... Uh, here, when it sure, a, it talks about you wanting to challenge other people's belief and enable that their beliefs are rooted in logic, and you're at you're calling in to ask Matt, you wouldn't you didn't technically say you wanted to ask me, but if if you were asking either of us, you know that sure. the thing we're going to advocate for is utilization and promotion of skepticism, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I wouldn't have so called in otherwise. That would have been rather foolish. But your theistic belief your faith-based belief, do you have a reason that is that justifies it, which is acceptable, which would be appealing to a skeptic, that meets a, meets a burden of proof that would be satisfactory for a skeptic? I don't know, to be entirely honest with you. And I, this is, I this is the know. point I was going to get to. I thought it would be a question or two later. Then don't you need to find that out before you can tell other people to utilize skepticism? on their belief, if you aren't sure whether or not your belief can be satisfactorily uh, justified post-skeptical inquiry, then how can you expect anybody else to do what for their belief what you haven't done for yours? So I'm really glad that you asked that question because if I can be super honest and upfront with you, as somebody who is very much um, avoidant of things like conflict. I'm very fearful as a natural just kind of condition. The question I asked was about me. It's about challenging my own beliefs, about evaluating my own condition. So why don't we just do but that? The word it is. Landon, why well, don't we just yeah, sure. tell us what your I'm belief is. Be tell Matt and I what specific faith claim you have or what specific theistic belief you have. We'll ask you some questions about it. And at the very minimum, we'll tell you whether as skeptics you've met our standard. Sure, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do that. Let's do it. Now, my primary, I, I grew up in kind of a, a fundamentalist Christian sort of faith, and I still hold to um, the Abrahamic God as described in the Bible, but not in the way that he described that's how I would put it. Would it be fair to there say that... Of... I, I'm sorry, because no, I grew up stuff. similar. No, I grew up similar, and, and I just wonder, would it be fair to say that you were indoctrinated into a fairly standard Protestant version of Christianity, but over time have come to develop your own 
version of that by eliminating the things that you reject and that don't make sense and that you find immoral or problematic or wrong and still keeping the things that you haven't kind of removed yet. No, that would that would be spot on. It's almost like a surgical kind of dissection of your own faith. Yeah. Okay. I'm right there with you. I, I did the same thing. So now that back hey. onto the topic of it, it surviving skeptical scrutiny, what good reasons would you say? Because the foundation that you just described, obviously, no skeptic is going to say starting with the belief that you were indoctrinated into and then morphing it to be more palatable is a reasonable method to get to a truth, right? That's not going to be sure. something would, we would, would say. Agree. So what is the method? What is the reason that you are hoping would su suffice for a skeptic to say, okay, yeah, that, that's a reasonable belief to hold? Well, I, I don't want to pull from any biblical claim. I throw that out. I've already had conversations with literalists and fundamentalists that trying to claim that a book, an extant book that we can demonstrate there are flaws in is flawless. Is, we don't is need to committed. focus any time on the arguments you're not going to make. Yeah. Let's just focus yeah. on the arguments you okay, will. Okay, sure, sure. Sorry. My primary argumentation, as weak as it may be, is simply observing complexity and looking at that and going, and granted, I I know that this is somewhat fallacious, but looking at that complexity and realizing that either via these complex processes over time or through spontaneous creation, whichever you want to adhere to, it seems, at least to me, somewhat likely that something outside of naturalistic processes could have had a hand in it. So rather than me tell you why I reject that, we're, ta we're exploring your ability to be skeptical with it, right? So you're talking to two skeptics. So, you can pick yeah. either one of us if you want to cosplay mm -hmm. as one of us, or you sure. can just try to say, I think a skeptic would say. So you've just said that out loud. What do you think a skeptic would reply, would respond to what you just said? What are the words you think a skeptic would, would say in response? Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because as soon as I was saying it, I immediately understood what the articulation was, which is that there isn't a need for that kind of externality. There isn't even a need for that thing to be personified with human characteristics. You know, that would be like saying something along the lines of naturalistic evolution must have some kind of external process to take place. But I can't demonstrate to you that that external process is taking place. You only have what you can observe, test, and evaluate. So as a person who's wanting to be a skeptic, who's wanting to believe for good reasons, how should that influence yeah. the belief that at the beginning of this call you held? Well, honestly, it probably just needs to get tossed. I don't think it necessarily has to go into the no bin. I don't. I mean, I don't know what you're implying with it. Because uh, there's still more well, exploration I mean, to go. There's still more questions to ask. Sure, but it's fine sure. to go. At the beginning of this call, I believed that the complexity of life uh, demonstrates that there must be something. And through this call and ask not you didn't actually we haven't we haven't told you a reason why anything's bad yet. All you did was ask and maybe it helped to go out loud. And then you answered out loud. It's fine to do mm -hmm. that and go, I now realize my position should be, I don't know if that's true. I now realize I should go look more. I should go read yeah. more. I should go explore no, more. No, you're 100%. It, 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 anybody I, who... I have a follow-up. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Matt. No, I just have a follow-up when we, when we get to that spot. So a after having talked about this, um, I, I, I realized when I was in a similar point, not not remotely saying, Landon, that we went down the same path or anything else. I'm just saying, I, I, you know, this, oh, I've been where you were and I got better. That's not it. Um, there are similarities. <laughs> and and so after I got rid of the things that were, um, so there's three categories, which I mentioned in the debate that I did that I, claims that are evidently true, claims that are not evidently true, and claims that are evidently not true. And so the third one, that means these are claims that we would normally just call false. Uh, yeah. Once I got rid of the claims that were false, evidently not true, and 
I had to sideline the, the claims within Christianity that were not evidently true, not supported by evidence, and set those aside as saying, I can't believe these until they are supported by evidence. All that left were the claims that were evidently true. And for me, the only things that I could find within there that were evidently true were absolutely mundane things like the names of places Location. and people. Yeah, stuff like that. And it seems to me that if the big issue of there being a God at all, uh, or that we have any sort of word from a God or anything that ties to the Bible or Christianity, if none of the substantive things tied to Christianity or um, Islam or Scientology, if none of those things are evidently true, then I can't identify with them. I can't accept them. It, I, I might I might find myself wanting to cling to them. And at that point, what mm -hmm. I found was was more along the lines of saying, I hope this is true, or I wish this is true, or I yeah. want this to be true. And I just reached a point where, first of all, I actually don't hope that it's true. Uh, I'm with Hitchens in the notion that a God sitting up there watching uh, and judging uh, people based on who they love and who they're attracted to or allowing a child to be assaulted and molested or um, allowing someone to starve and hunger or creating a worm that burrows into your eye and that's the only way the worm can live is to burrow into your eye and leave its, its you know, the notion that in order for things to live, other things have to die. All of these things get together and I'm like, oh, I can believe that these were the best guesses of Bronze and Iron Age people trying to figure out the world we live in and that now we know more and that we're just kind of hangering, hanging on to these things as, as sort of lingering beliefs. So the question, the, the follow-up question is, is there anything that ties to whatever portion of theistic belief you have that you would acknowledge is not evidently true, but that you still, like, wish it were evidently true? Or is it just, like, cling, is it more of it, it's still clinging onto you in an abstract sense, or are you really trying to cling onto it to find it? I, now that I'm actually processing this for the first time, um, I, I would have to say it would be the concept of eternality. The idea that life can possess meaning beyond the present day. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, I had a very unfortunate upbringing. I came from a separated home. I'm currently living with a chronic illness at the age of 23 that significantly impedes my ability to do much of anything outside of work and sleep. My life does not hold a lot of intrinsic value right now. And it is comforting, but it blatantly is, shamefully as it is to admit that, to believe that the suffering that I am enduring has some kind of additional meaning. Because if it doesn't, and I would presume that you would ascribe that it doesn't, well, shit, my life fucking sucks. <laughs> Landon, the thing is, is the thing you just described I could have given as my own bio, and then I could have said, uh, my life has no intrinsic value, and I get a lot of comfort out of the fact that neither does anybody else's. And therefore, my value is what I make it. Uh, but I don't, I don't go out, Landon. I, I deal with significant chronic illness. I'm trying to get more of a social life now. The last few months, it's been impossible because it got so bad. Yeah. Uh, but my life right now is work and sleep. That's, that's really it. Uh, a friend and I recently started playing a pirate game together. That's been nice. Uh, but an online friend. You don't know her. She goes to a different school. She lives in Canada. Uh, anyway, uh, so so it's it, as far as concepts of perspective um, go, even when you have there's a, a concept in this book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which isn't a perfect book. I know there are people who see it as a bit of a, a 
self-help shitty thing, but there's there's a, a, a part in there that sort of emphasizes that while things might not be your fault, everything is your responsibility, your value, yeah. your meaning out of life, everything that uh, how you are going to go forward. There's it's impossible to transfer responsibility to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that might be an interesting book for somebody like you, uh, uh, in the situation you're in, it was for me. Um, and, uh, I usually read it after breakups. Uh, it's a really good, it's a really good book after a breakup, mm. the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Uh, but it's, it, yeah, I, I mean, literally what you were describing as in, you know, it was only three statements, but I was like, yo, cool. We're twins. And I have a totally <laughs> different experience with, what I would say I am now, which is a bit of a universal nihilist. I, I acknowledge that there's no intrinsic meaning or prescribed meaning from the universe. Uh, and therefore, I get to find joy in the meaning that I do find out of it. Because, Landon, keep in mind, if God doesn't exist and if your faith isn't true, then the thing you got meaning from wasn't those things. You didn't actually get purpose and meaning from God if God doesn't exist. You didn't get it from the religion. If the religion is untrue, you got it over out of what you made of those things. No, you're absolutely right. I want to recommend a website for you to go to. I just want to make sure that it's uh, still active and legit. Yes, go to theatheistbook.com. Full disclosure, this is a book put together by someone who I'm friends with uh, several years ago, where he ran around and uh, photographed and interviewed atheists from all around the world. Um, I think there's like over 50 in there. I don't quote me on the number, but it's like uh, AC Grayling, Adam Pascal, Alex Honnold, Cara Santa Maria, Carol Blue, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, well, Carol's uh, is Hitchens' widow. Charles Strauss, Dan Dennett, Darren Brown, Donald Johnson, James Randi, Watson, uh, Janet Asimov. It keeps going on. Julia James Sweeney, Randy. Lawrence, Brown, ton, tons of people in there. Um, and all of this is about their thoughts on um, joy and meaning in a world without a God belief. And these mm-hmm. interviews he put together into a documentary as well. Full disclosure, I'm featured in the documentary, so you'll get my thoughts as well. Um, but the book is is outstanding, and it, it's one of a handful of books that I recommend to, to people. Uh, and if if you're not able to get a copy of the book, uh, send me an email, and I'll find a way to either get you a copy of the book or the documentary. But okay, thank you. Sure, cool. So, last thing I got for you, Landon, is if you want to encourage other people to be skeptical. Do exactly the exercise we did uh, yourself more and then share with how you do that with other people. Because, again, remember, as far as the actual meat of a belief, you called in, you shared your belief. We didn't tell you what was wrong with the belief. We asked you to think about and tell us what you think we would say. And by the by mm-hmm. the time you said it, you went, crap, this isn't a belief worth holding on to <laughs> in at least the affirmative. Yeah. Do that. Just keep doing that and you'll be fine. And if you ever find okay. that your theistic beliefs have a good evidential warrant, it calls. please let me know. Yeah. <laughs> will, do, will do. I've listened to your story and, you know, like probably six or seven hours straight of you just, you know, deconstructing these really basic fallacious arguments that people hold to. And I don't want to, I don't want to be in that boat. Yeah. You and me both. All right, Landon. Thank you for, Thanks so much for the call. Appreciate you. No problem. Thank you. Goodbye. See ya. Hey, it's Jimmy Snow here. I'm the executive producer on the line with a fun fact. Did you know 100% of the hosts of this channel enjoy eating? It's true. And if you would like to help contribute to their ongoing addiction, you can do so by going over to Patreon or becoming a channel member. There are show-specific, host-specific tiers. Those are awesome. But also, you can leave a super thanks with a special little highlighted comment. You can like, comment, and subscribe. All of those will help fill our, our, our whittle, whittle bellies. By the way, check out some of these, this content over here. (laughs) Algorithm, what next?